English craftsmen built Hampton Court, a home for kings. Above the gate hang Tudor King Henry VIII's arms, guarded by twin ranks of the king's beasts. Heraldic monsters, heroes of legend, the seasons of the year adorn the garden. Dedicated 400 years ago to the pleasure of princes, today it is a playground for children. A refuge for the old. A place where all can find a brief moment of repose and beauty. Hampton Court is now a public park and ordinary people pass beneath the royal emblem, which they have made their own, the English Rose. Roses grow today in the tilt yard, which King Henry built for his tournaments. Damask Roses, the oldest of all, which the Crusaders found and brought back to England. It was roses like these that grew in temple gardens, when in 1455, one man picked a red rose and another a white rose. And for 30 years, the flower of England's manhood was slain in the bloodiest of civil wars. Peace after civil war came with the Tudor kings, and a new rose grew in the gardens, blending the white of York and the red of Lancaster in its petals. And today, the white and red rose grow in peace side by side along these walls. A knot garden with low clipped borders around massed herbs was once to be seen in every nobleman's ground. They've all disappeared now, except this one in Hampton Court. The old craftsmen who built and planted so well are gone now, but their work remains. And today the folk who stroll here share with their forefathers the inborn love of Englishmen for a garden. There are proofs of this love in all the parks, in all the towns. Find great gardens up and down the land, their variety reflecting the individual imagination of their makers. Some are formally designed, some copies from Italian models, some a happy blending of English lawn and formal pool. Some a wedding of art and nature so that you can't tell where the garden ends and the woodland begins. a garden that is all green. Green branches meet above, annihilating all that's made to a green thought in a green shade. And then the procession of green gives place to the color of flowers. A 
An English gardener built this miniature mountain in the heart of Buckinghamshire and planted it with flowers from every corner of the world. England, poor and rich alike, have flowers. Whatever the limitations of his garden, the gardener accepts them as a challenge to his skill, and his reward is so much the greater. The cottager fills his few square yards with the old favourites his father grew. The keeper of a Thames lock turns his narrow strip into a miniature Kew Garden. This gardener specializes in auriculars. It is not his money, but his care and skill that grow these blooms. Suburban streets are bright with tiny front gardens. handicap of space or place can prevent a true gardener from creating beauty. George Russell took an ordinary blue lupin. For 20 years, in his spare moments as a jobbing gardener, he experimented with it in his allotment. This is what he made. Lupins die. And all those other flowers, the favorites of other gardeners, die too. But to the gardener, this is not an end. It is a new and exciting beginning. For last year's glories bear the seeds of next year's greater glories. Flowers worthy of a king's garden. Flowers worthy of countless English gardens, great and small, in the peaceful years to come.